So, Mark. <clears throat> Mark's a great gospel. I've always really liked Mark because, you know, I just, somehow he makes sense to me. Um, Luke does as well. John, yeah, I'm getting the hang of John. Matthew, a bit Jewish, but yeah, it's all right. Uh, but Mark has been, you know how it is, some things just gel with you a bit better. And that's, that's whatever you read. Mark really gels with me. And he's writing a gospel for Christians in Rome. And he's writing this gospel based on the eyewitness accounts of Peter, so it appears. He's writing for these Roman Christians and their situation in life is hard. They are Christians under pressure. How comes that about? They are following a crucified Messiah, which means they're anathema to the Jewish people, at the heart of the evil empire of their day in the very city of Rome itself. And because they proclaim Christ as king, and we've seen that's the essence of Jesus' message from Mark 1.15, because they proclaim Christ as king, they're anathema to the Romans as well. So get it from both sides. Now, I reckon Mark was written very early, uh, one of the first Gospels written about AD 65. And I believe that because the people who don't believe that are the people who say, Mark could not have written Mark 13 prophesying the fall of Jerusalem before AD 70 when Jerusalem fell. I don't hold with that at all. You could perfectly well have done. There are lots of examples of biblical prophecy happening, and I don't think that's a valid comment at all. There are lots of other reasons that it looks as if Mark is quite early. Maybe around 65 AD, certainly by before 70, otherwise there would have been more detail in the account in Mark 13 anyway. However, it does mean that Mark was written for people living through the longish reign of Nero, who was emperor from 54 to 68 AD, were heading into the turbulent year of the four emperors after Nero, when everything was in a turmoil in Rome, that's AD 68, and they had only Vespasian to look forward to from AD 69 to 79. So they're in a bit of a bind. They're under pressure. Things were not great for them. They were in a situation where being a clear, outspoken follower of Jesus and fisher of men was not going to lead to a desperately easy life. This is normal. That sort of life is biblically normal. Very famously, a man who has spent his life working in dangerous situations behind the lines, as it were, for the kingdom of God in countries where it, you know, it is very dangerous to be a Christian. A man who's done that, famously, a couple of years back, stood up in front of a big Christian gathering in this country. And everybody's really excited because word had quietly gone round that the mystery speaker tonight was going to be this guy. And um, he stood, and they were expecting a big full-scale preach, you know, inspiring and all this. And he famously stood up and he opened his Bible and he read a passage of scripture where Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And he turned to the audience and said, look at you. What is the matter with you? This is not biblically normal. And walked out. <laughs> wow, a bit of a showstopper. How'd you get through? There's no willingness to live like that. Mark is written for people who are living like that. Where the temptation to keep quiet about the word of God and the testimony of Jesus is naturally very strong. That's the problem, isn't it? It's going to be hard for you if you, if you do what Jesus has just been saying. You know, kingdom of God's coming, repent, believe the gospel, I'll make you fishers of men. Come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's going to lead to trouble. Yeah, get on with it. Go for that. The temptation to keep it sh -sh 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 is going to be pretty strong. And we've seen developing in, in our land and in our culture, in our time, you know, the idea of what I call cool Christianity. You know, big, strong apologetic movement. That is great, but why is it there? Why is, why, not everybody, but by all means, but, but why are so many people flocking to this? Because it makes it look intellectually respectable. Because it doesn't mean we're going to get laughed at for being numpties. Now, biblically, that isn't normal. That is not the norm. These guys are in a situation where there's tremendous temptation to keep quiet about the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And moreover, the temptation in those circumstances where it is hard, heavy going, the temptation to think, what is the point? Must have been huge. Must have been huge. During that period, as your efforts at obeying Christ's command to follow him and be a fish of men are met with, let's call it a mixed response, and were questionably fruitful. We don't like sharing our faith when there isn't observable fruit, do we? 
That issue of the apparent fruitlessness but actual fruitfulness of the task is the recurring theme of this chapter. Apparently fruitless, actually fruitful. But you don't see it. Because the work of the kingdom of God is so covert, you do not know. You do not know. The temptation to despair of it in the life setting of the recipients of this letter would be immense. And the point that's being made over against the situation is the quiet power of the word of God getting emphasised again and again and again. It's a bit like Macmillan, isn't it? You know, it was Macmillan, wasn't it? Speak quietly and carry a big stick. I'm pretty sure it was. I used to think of it while he was walking around Oxford as an old guy when we were students on his cane, you know? Did you ever see him with his little cane? Yeah, there's his big stick. <laughs> Speak quietly, carry a big stick. The gospel packs a big punch, but it's covert activity. So here that all is in this context. Uh, we saw that the beginning of this section, Mark 3.13, was the appointing of the 12 apostles, and there's a meet they're there to go out with the message. They're to lead the going out with this message of the kingdom that Jesus introduced in the first chapter or so. Right? So there's the 12 appointed, and immediately he's got opposition. He's got opposition from his family, from religious leaders, and again from the family. It's in the context of opposition we're being told these things. Then in the middle part of that section, from 3.13 to 6.6, it's the middle bit chapters 4 and 5 basically you get four parables and four miracles and the four parables about the power the secret working power of the word of God if you share it the way Jesus has been saying and then there are these four miracles that show Jesus' actual power the power in his personality yeah? the power of the word the power of the Lord and then closing off that section again there's the return to the theme of the opposition and the hard going that it is So, that's a couple of pages out of the way in no time. Look at that. Whoosh, they're gone. If you're faithful to Christ, all you Roman Christians, that this gospel is written for, just expect the opposition your own master suffered, often from the most hurtful of quarters, and bear in mind that it's going to be hard going. And don't stop because it's hard going. Get on because it's hard going, because that's authentic, and that's the way it ought to be in a world that's hostile to God. And here in that context, the big point Jesus has been making about the apparent fruitlessness but actual fruitfulness of the preaching of the word of God in the previous passage we looked at last time. The four soils, the four results. Three fruitless and passing away, one fruitful and continuing. They know this is set in a context of the preach word, not apparently bearing fruit, but rather being opposed. So, we were saying last time, how confusing that can be for people. The thing about the Bible is that it's on a mission. It's got a message. It's got something to say. It's not a poem. It's not a play. It's not a novel that's there to help you get in touch with yourself, your emotions, your experiences, get in touch with your past. The Bible's there for a different purpose, to help you get in touch with your God. And here is God getting in touch with us, saying, I'm giving you something. It looks as if it's going to be weak, poor, ineffective, and useless. Do what I say with it. Just do what I say with it. And actually, see and experience the covert power of the word of God. He also said to them, Mark 4, 21, a lamp, and he also refers back to the parable of the sower that's just happened, you see. A lamp isn't brought to be put under a basket or under a bed, is it? It's a bit Monty Python, that, isn't it? There's a bit of a sense of humour going on, yeah? There's a, um, yeah, a bit of surreal humour. Come on, use your noddle. Right? You don't bring a lamp in to put it under a basket or under a bed. Isn't it to be placed on a lampstand? Nothing's hidden except to be revealed. Nothing concealed except to be brought to the light. So what's going on? Jesus told that outdoor agricultural parable about the sower and the soil and Jesus comes straight indoors in the evening to tell this simple little parable of the lamp. Okay. I'm not saying that chronologically that's the way it worked out in the ministry of Jesus. I'm saying that's the way Mark has arranged it because he's working in a pattern. He's working in a pattern built for oral learners to, to remember the teaching of Jesus on this issue of persevering in spreading the word of the kingdom when it's hard and doesn't look like much is happening. It's a really clever structure going on here for the sake of those oral 
learners. I should have done a diagram perhaps. Maybe, maybe I'll do a diagram for you next time or something because we'll be in the next little bit. But there are two short parables. They're not much more than short aphorisms, little proverb, little proverbial sayings, short wisdom sayings, the lamp and the measure. And they both get a little explanation, both introduced by the word gar, which is to say this explains that. There's a structure going on here, a pattern, a panel. And those two units are linked together by, by means of a concluding and, and an introductory exhortation. If you've got ears, listen, 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 listen. Which is an invitation really to think about it. What he's saying is a little bit covert. It's a little bit hidden. We'll see why in a minute. You've got to think about it. Think about it. What's being said? Mark is addressing the issue of the secret power of the proclamation of God's word. And he's doing it to those who are not just in the big crowd interested in Jesus, but who are pressing on to know the Lord. Jesus said in, in chapter 4, verse 11, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to the rest it's told in parables. Those who are pressing on, the secret is revealed to those who press on to know the Lord. It's not a secret that's there to, to put a ring around and keep people out. It's a secret that's there to be pressed on and got closer to God in trying to find the answer to. What's this about? It's an open secret like that. I'll say a bit more in a minute. Building on that basic premise here is this parable of the lamp, right? And, and, and the lamp and the lamp stand. That's the important bit. He says, you would not have been given what you have been given. And he's referring, no doubt, to the gospel in order to hide it. That's the big, the big issue. The lamp, the luknos, is one of these things here. Can you see it well enough? It's just a little bowl thing with a spout. And you put animal fat in there and there's a sort of a wick that lies in it just lies in it and you like this end and they gutter and they spit and they yeah. and they're dull, they're dull light they're not a brilliant light but it's what they had it's a dull old light very common everyday object and when the oral learners in the churches of Rome slaves soldiers or patricians saw a lamp being brought in at dusk and placed on a stand they would receive a reminder to be faithful in propagating the word of God the message of the kingdom regardless of how fruitful or dim or whatever else it seemed to be and they'd be warned that what had been revealed to them was designed to be revealed by them. What's been revealed to you is meant to be revealed by you. Is that making sense? The very point of a lamp, the very purpose of raising this light source up on a stand is to shine as much light into the surrounding darkness as possible. So, Caleb, if you've got a light, right, a torch or something, and you've got it lying on the floor, how much does it light the room? We go camping. We got a head torch and we put it on the, on, the, on the carry mat. Is that the way we do it? What do we do? Put it on your head because it's a head torch. Shouldn't have picked a head torch. Should have picked an ordinary torch. My mistake. Ordinary torch, Caleb, back to the beginning. So we got this ordinary torch. You turn it on. Do you lay it on the floor or what do you do with it? In the tent. You might hold it or you might on the... Which is there for the purpose, exactly. Mm. We, if we go camping, we don't take a palace. We take a ridge tent, a little two-man, three-man tent, something. We take a torch and we hang it on the jobby because then it gives light to the whole tent. You take the same light source, the same power, and you raise it up and it distributes light, yeah? And the light shines in the darkness and it spreads out. What he's saying is this. You can take the simple clay lamp filled with oil in your hand and what you do with that luknos, you put it onto a luknia. And when you do that, it's rather weak and it's smoky and it's smutty light. But just by exposing it higher up in the room, it gives light to the whole place. What you do not do with it is put it straight under a modion. Now I'll fill you in because you just need to know this. Um, a modion is a dry measure, okay? Uh, with various translations put it under a basket or whatever. It was about um, 16 sextarii or one sixth of the attic medimnus, about a peck, which is nine litres. So it's a dry measure of volume. Right? It's a measuring thing, a gauging bucket, if you like. The word is a Latinism, incidentally. It reflects the culture that people Mark's writing to. It's a Latin expression. Would you light a lamp, go through all that, bring it in, and immediately cover it with a dry measure? Nonsense. Crazy. Um, it, it's, not, it's not quite as zany as it may first appear. Duncan Derrett has done a lot of work on um, the, the later, um, slightly later, Jewish laws and how it applies to New Testament stuff and whatever. And he says that it was quite, 
quite common at the end of the day on the Sabbath, that is Friday night, to take the modi on and put that over the lamp so that the flame would be extinguished by the bucket because then it wasn't work to put the light out on the Sabbath, uh, which sounds a bit odd to us. So it's an idea they've got in their heads, this idea of, uh, you know, snuffing it rather than putting it out with your hands because that would be work on the Sabbath. See what I mean? They put the bucket, it's quite a known way of putting something out. Um, the ridiculous thing then is, is not using a dry measure of volume to snuff out a flame, but of lighting a lamp which would gutter and smoke and well stink a bit to be honest, through that first nasty bit of lighting the lamp only to snuff it out very soon afterwards. It's not about the ridiculousness of putting a bucket on a lamp. It's a matter of the ridiculousness of going through the torture of lighting the wretched thing in the first place, having all that trouble and hardship and going through the difficult bit. And then instead of putting it on a stand and letting it shine and enjoying it, it's just uh, uh, put the bucket on it. Yeah. Does that make sense? The stuff I read for you guys. I'll work that out. But there you go. <laughs> no, I did, I did. You've had the hard bit, he says. Now you're going to quit without enjoying and benefiting from the light. Where's the joy in, in being, becoming a Christian? That's it. We'll keep quiet about that now. What, what, what nonsense is that? You become a Christian, you've got light flowing through your soul. You pick it up, you put it on a stand. Guys, look at this. Jesus is brilliant. And they go, what? Eh? what? And your friends start looking into And there is no joy like leading somebody to Christ. You want to do something that's going to last. That's going to last forever. And seeing the joy and the light flowing into them. And then seeing them starting sharing their faith and teaching the word of God to other people. Oh, bring it on. It's an amazing experience, isn't it? Are you so stupid, he says, as to go light your lamp and go through all that trauma of, you know, getting the light in the first place. Take it in, snuff it out. What is the matter with you? Stick it on the lampstand. Alternatively, he says, this is funny, would you put it under a bed? You're looking for an easy life by not making too much of the gospel. You know, you want a restful, quiet, peaceful, yeah. What would be the outcome of putting it under a bed? See, hiding the light is destructive, isn't it? Hiding the light, you end up with no rest for yourself. Why? Because you've got no bed. You've set fire to it. It's gone. What you try and do for a bit of peace and rest actually destroys the rest you're trying to get. Don't put it under a bed. Jesus is about to unveil what he's getting at here in the next little bit. We're still on verses 21 to 25. He said that the lamp isn't brought to be put under a basket or under a bed, is it? Isn't it, isn't it to be placed on a lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed and nothing concealed except to be brought to light. If anyone has ears, he'd better listen. Now that is the imperative implication of the imperfect there. That is the, the, imperat that is the imperative of uh, what it's trying to say. It's not a matter of he who has ears, let him hear. That's a passive, okay? That's not what's going on. It's saying, you got ears, you better listen. So it's a better translation altogether. Hope you like it. See, the gospel of the kingdom has to be born a little bit undercover because of the circumstances. There are Romans to worry about in Jesus' ministry. There are the Erodian collaborators with Rome to worry about. There are the Pharisees who don't want to rock the political boat but very much want to decry the evils of collaborating with Rome. And then there are those who want to sustain a first century Palestinian form of jihad against the Romans and any Jew that collaborates with them. And each of those can take a little snippet out of here and there of what Jesus' ministry and completely mess it up from ever being able to get on with what he's there to do. There has to be this slightly covert underground expression of God's truth that people have to go away and think about and come to the right conclusions about. Otherwise his ministry is going to come to a very shuddering halt very quickly. Because each of those elements can fasten, groups can fasten onto elements in, in what Jesus has got as his message. The message of the kingdom of God and make their own something out of it that could have deeply unfortunate consequences for Jesus' message and mission. So it's got to be slightly concealed it's got to be slightly circumspect. Jesus is, is circumspect and outspoken all at once. And, and the way he achieves that is, is by this enigmatic, partial, proverbial, parable-based revelation of truth. Here's this thing you know. Go and work out what it is you don't know from it. 
speaks in a slightly oblique, slightly enigmatic way. Mark is very big on what's called the messianic secret. But, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not an esoteric, private, elitist or, or exclusive secret in the manner of so many of the ancient world's religions, you know, the, the, the secret mystery rites in, in, in the Greek world and stuff. It's not like that. The secret of the kingdom of God is meant to come out. Yep, it'll come right out after, after Christ's death and resurrection, after the outpouring of Pentecost, the gospel age to which marks Roman Christians as much as we here and, and now ourselves all together belong. Dick France, who, who taught me at Bible college, and you knew Dick France and stuff, uh, he was a New Testament scholar, a Matthew specialist, he's written a lot on Mark as well, a good commentary on Mark. He puts it nicely like this, like the organiser of a treasure hunt, he hides things in order that they may be found. Now, if he said openly and whatever, then what he was actually saying wouldn't have been found because people would have made their own thing of it. But like the organiser of a treasure hunt, he hides things, so you've got to actually think it through a bit and find. The natural, sinful human tendency is to retain secret knowledge for oneself. But Jesus expects his people under pressure for the kingdom of God to see that their purpose is not to keep it to themselves, but to do just the opposite. Is that making sense? And doing that is going to bring blessing. But failing to propagate the biblical understanding you've received is going to result in even what you have been given being taken from you. Now that's the other side of the coin. If you've got it and you don't share it, you're going to lose it. So how am I going to illustrate that? Let's go back to um, 1994 in Gravesend where we are asked to take over, we're offered to take over, I don't know, somehow we get to take over a derelict chapel building. Yeah? It's a derelict building that's just on the verge of being sold to the Muslims for a mosque in an inner urban, multi-ethnic area. It's come to its knees. It's been a very big, thriving chapel. It's had very good connections. It's had very good ministry in the past. And what's happened to that place is that they've come to see um, bringing people to Christ as God's work. Not our work, it's nothing to do with us. If God wants to save people, he is sovereign. And God will save. It's, it's, it's impertinent of us to try and tell people about him because that's his work. It's impertinent of us, it's a denial of his sovereignty. I'm just, this is not my view. <laughs> this is not right, okay, this is rubbish. But this is the view that people can come to. It is wrong of us to try and win people to Christ because that is presumptuous. God must do all of that. And you get this sort of pseudo-high view of the sovereignty of God that means we do not do what God has sovereignly ordained that we should. Yeah, does that make sense? What happens to that church? Zohar Chapel in Gravesend, case in point. Zoar was the place that Lot fled to out of Sodom. You can see they had exclusivist tendencies from the beginning, right? <laughs> it's a privilege to be there. It's a privilege to put Hope Church in that building. Different direction of travel there. That chapel, by the time we got hold of it, the building, it was full of water. It was running with streams of rivulets coming down the wall every time it rained. It had dry rot. Fruit in bodies grown out the wall as big as your head. Uh, the wood had gone a bit. It was a, it was a landmark, a local landmark, pointing to the, to the ineffectiveness of Christianity, right? But it wasn't because the Christianity had gone a long time before. If you do not propagate the biblical understanding that you receive, there comes a point where God says, I'm turning the light out and locking the door. We dare not retain the knowledge of the gospel, keeping it to ourselves at the expense of lost people around us, because if we do so, God will snuff out the light. You won't need to put it under a basket yourself. It'll be gone. And the church and the people of God have spread the light. We must never become discouraged from doing that because of the hiddenness of the work of God, of the word in the world. 
We persevere with it steadily, not knowing what God is doing with what we've done. But we do not keep to ourselves what we've received because of the parable of the lamp. If we do so, we will lose what we've got. So Jesus is about to move the discussion about the power of the word working secretly forward. He's going to do it by deploying the aphorism of the seed that grows secretly. But for today, and for the time we've got today, here's the parable of the lamp. The measure you use will be the measure you receive, and more will be added to you. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. The lamp has been given. The lamp has been lit. The difficult stuff is done. Put it on the stand. Let it shine. And there are times when that is challenging. There are times when that is difficult. There are times when it is difficult to persevere, believing that God will do something with what we let shine. But he shone into our hearts the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And his purpose in doing that is not that we should extinguish that to have a quieter, easier, less troubled life but that we should make that known to those who are around us.